Welcome to the Austin Board of Realtors annual meeting. Please welcome your 2022 president-elect, Ashley Jackson. Good morning, y'all. It is so wonderful to see all of you here today. And for those of you joining us virtually, welcome to all of you as well. I'm Ashley Jackson, your president-elect for the Austin Board of Realtors and Actress MLS. It is my pleasure to officially call our 2022 annual meeting to order. I feel like I need like a gavel, right? Yeah. <laughs> our annual meeting is always a can't miss event for my business. Not only do I get to reconnect with so many of you, but I get a sneak peek of what my association and MLS are going to do for me next year. It's perfect timing with our business planning for the next year, so I can be confident that I'm making the most of my membership and working smarter, not harder. Working smarter, not harder, is something that's on all of our minds right now. 2022 was our year of thriving. At the beginning of the year, we celebrated the return of in-person networking and meetings while holding on to some of the efficiencies we gained during the pandemic. As we end the year, we're learning what it means to thrive in a shifting housing market. For many of us, the first real market shift since we became a realtor. But as always, Abor has you covered. This fall, we launched a market shift conversation series to give you expert guidance on what to do next. We increased our number of free MLS trainings like Remind and RPR so that you had the best farming and CMA tools in your pocket. Looking ahead to next year, I'm excited to announce 2023 as our year of connection. More now than ever, ABOR is laser focused on being the engine of your success and connecting with you where you are with the tools that you need. There's so much more to come and I look forward to serving as your president next year. <laughs> But first, here to highlight some of Abor and Actress's extraordinary efforts and achievements this past year, please welcome your 2022 board president, Cord Shiflett. Good morning, everybody. I'm so glad to see y'all. Uh, I was just thinking back to like seven or eight years ago, we would sit in board meetings and say, did, did we have an annual meeting? I don't remember. And now we've got rooms full of them. So it's so great to do this and to have all of you guys here. So thank you for coming. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all this morning. Our annual meeting is a chance to celebrate all that we've accomplished throughout our year. Even as a board member, I'm always blown away when I see everything put together in our annual report. If you haven't yet scanned the QR code on the back of your program, look at our, to look at our 2022 annual report, you can do that now. It is super entertaining to read, uh, but there's a lot of great data in there. So uh, check it out and read through it. To kick off this year's State of the Association, I want to spotlight three of my favorite moments from my year as president. All three are firsts as ABOR's 95-year history and are reasons why ABOR is well-known as one of the most innovating realtor associations in the country. One of my goals was to bring agents together and give back in a big way to our community. In June, we did just that. Our Central Texas Realtor Service Day gave nearly 1,500 wellness kits to our homeless neighbors throughout the Austin area. 300 of you guys gathered right here in this room to assemble the kits and deliver, deliver them throughout the city. Each kit had food and personal items donated by members, along with housing applications for Community First Village. It was a truly remarkable day and it wouldn't have been possible without all of you guys' support. If you didn't know, the ABOR Foundation has a 10-year, $1 million commitment to Community First. If you haven't been to Community First, I really encourage all of you to go out and take the time. You can join the ABOR Foundation for a Community First service project, which we're gonna be doing next year. Second, ABOR had its first ever international trade delegation to Ireland this summer. Through our award-winning global program, ABOR is the NAR Ambassador Association to Ireland. In addition, in addition to having partnerships with CREA in Canada and AMPI in Mexico. A delegation of several ABOR members and staff, including myself, attended what the, this is the equivalent of their NAR called the Institute of Professional Auctioneers and Valuers. Uh, they hosted a conference in Ireland in July. 
Our CEO, Emily Chenevere, was a featured speaker, and we had several meetings with IPAV leaders uh, and conference attendees to uh, discuss how we can collaborate and support real estate agents in both of our countries. We're already planning another international trade mission for next year, and I'm thrilled to see our global program continue to, go, to grow. Earlier this month, ABOR Global earned a platinum rating for NAR's Global Business Achievement Program for the fourth year in a row. That was awesome. Last but not least, I'm most proud of our, our Central Texas Housing Summit that was held here at ABOR headquarters back in July. It was our first big omni-channel event at ABOR and hundreds of you guys attended in person or tuned in online or you watched the recording after the event. During the summit, ABOR and the Austin Chamber examined the state of housing throughout our region. Experts from all across the industry explored trends and challenges in residential home buying and selling, housing development, leasing and property management, and housing equity and affordability. I'm excited to announce that our Central Texas Housing Summit will become a permanent addition in the next level benefits and program programming you receive as an ABOR member moving forward. If you missed the event in July, you can still download the recording at abor.com slash housing summit. Speaking of member benefits, we've launched a lot of them this year. We're trying to meet you where you are with the events and programming we do. With the launch of ABOR Studios, ABOR's very own in-house -produ in production studio, earlier this year, we're now hosting events that can reach hundreds if not thousands of ABOR members at a time. This annual meeting, our Market Shift Conversation Series, and our Central Texas Housing Summit are all examples of successful omni-channel events we've hosted this year. In 2023, you can expect to see more ABOR programming offered in the same way. We're also doing more than ever before through our ABOR Academy. This year, we resumed in-person classes at our ABOR North and South locations, in addition to delivering high-quality CE classes and designations throughout ABOR on air. Now, our professional development team is hard at work again in 2022 to bring you ABOR On Demand. It's a fully virtual, distant education programming platform that will allow you to earn CE credit at your leisure, anytime, anywhere. In 2023, we'll be launching a full suite of CE courses, MLS training, and digital content through ABOR On Demand. In addition to bringing back in-person classes to ABOR headquarters, so stay tuned for that. Third, we continue to launch benefits that enhance both your professional and, per and personal well-being. Last summer, and you'll want to listen to this one. This is one I think you're all going to really enjoy and benefit from. Uh, uh, last December, ABOR partnered with Austin Regional Clinic to provide you with discounted subscription to 24-7 virtual doctor visits through Norman MD. This is a must-have subscription for realtors. It does not require health insurance. It's available to your entire family and offers unlimited visits. And it's staffed by local ARC doctors. We were really proud to bring you all that one. The discounted subscription cost that ABOR members get is often cheaper than what you'd pay for in just one in-person office visit with insurance. Claim this benefit by scanning the QR code on the screen or by visiting abor.com ARC. Finally, it would be a miss to not talk about how ABOR is elevating the industry and advocating for our own community with our research collaborating and reports. In April, we commemorated Fair Housing Month with our 2021 diversity report. This long-awaited follow-up to our 2019 report showed how we're closing the gap on having a board of directors that reflects our diverse membership and a membership that reflects the communities we serve. We were very proud of that. That was a big undertaking. First and foremost, we must be a community of belonging. On behalf of our board, I want to thank both the 2021 and 2022 diversity committees for bringing our latest diversity report to life. Thanks to their dedication and hard work, ABOR is now helping realtor associations around the country benchmark their diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. In July, ABOR and the Home Builders Association of Greater Austin released a landmark report on the impact of Austin's housing development fees on housing affordability. You all probably remember reading about this in the paper. The Central Texas Housing Development Fees Analysis showed that Austin is one of the most expensive cities to build a home in Texas and discourages the development of smaller, more affordable housing types. This report has been a watershed moment in the call for Austin's leaders to put housing first. It also helped lead to several important advocacy wins that our CEO, Emily Chenevere, will touch on shortly. 
But that's not all. This year, Abor's Goble released its third annual Central Texas International Homebuyers Report in collaboration with NAR Research. We were also chosen by NAR to pilot a local extension of their REACH Accelerator program, which helps discover emerging technologies in the real estate industry. If you attended one of these, our Innovation Showcase pitch events this year, you had the opportunity to provide real-time feedback on live business pitches from real estate tech startups. That's right, if you're keeping track, Abor has our own video production studio and our own tech accelerator now. Be on the lookout for a live in-person Reach Labs pitch battle to take place sometime next year. None of this work would have been possible without the hard work and dedication of our volunteer members. If you served on an ABOR or Actress Committee volunteer group, would you all please stand up and give these guys a round of applause? It looks like we've got a dozen or so of you all here. Thank you guys for all that you do. We've accomplished so much together this year and we simply don't have time to talk about all of it in detail. Here's a rapid fire list of ways you can elevate our industry this year. We set a new high water mark for tree pack. We raised the most money we've ever raised, which I was so proud of, raising over $600,000. And we reached a participation rate of 37%. We can do better than that next year, guys. Ashley, it's on you. Break the goal. Um, Realtor Giving through Abor Foundation was also at an all-time high with $70,000 awarded in higher education scholarships and $10,000 in local disaster relief funding given this year. Thank you guys for your contributions to that. Our industry awards celebration was back in person for the first time in two years with 300 of our industry's elite toasting to our 2021 industry awards winners. If you all get a chance to go to that go, it's a great night. And we brought back the Texas Realtors Leadership Program. Our 2022, this is a tongue twister, our 2022 TRLP class will graduate at our 2023 Board of Directors installation next week. Congratulations to all of you guys in that program. <laughs> I've set a goal of doing that program myself next year. Please come join me. It's awesome, the things that you learn in there. I'm so proud of all that we've achieved together this past year. On behalf of our board of directors and the best in-class staff here at ABOR, we're so grateful for your talent and dedication to make our association and our community a better place to live, to work, and to do business. And now to present the advocacy and MLS portions of our State of the Association address, please join me in welcoming the most badass CEO <laughs> you could ever ask for, Emily Chenevier. I'll pay you later for that sweet comment, Cord. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Cord, so much. Thank you for all of your hard work this year. Being the president of the association is no easy task, and it's been a joy and a fun relationship for us to build through the year. Um, hello, everyone. Before I dive in, I want to thank all of our board of directors for their hard work as volunteers in this organization. If you're a board of director, perhaps you would stand and just allow us to thank you for your service to the association. Those are my teammates, and together we continue to tackle incredibly complex market changes and industry developments. Um, my staff and I are all incredibly grateful for the relationship that we share and the guidance that you guys bring us, so thank you. As Cord mentioned, every ABOR member should download our annual report and read through it. Like, for real, you should scan the code. <laughs> When there's a big shift in your business, it's time to dig deep into your MLS tools and association benefits to ensure that you're protecting your career and that you're working smarter and not harder as this market shifts. Our annual report is effectively your playbook on how to do that. You can download the report using the QR code on the back of your program or on the screen. ABOR's had several major advocacy wins this year, fighting for you and your clients at the local, state, and national levels. First, ABOR prevented an increase in City of Austin parkland dedication fees. With this advocacy win, we prevented over, or excuse me, $5,500 in new development fees from being imposed on every new home built in Austin this year. I think all of us can agree that preventing adding to the cost of housing in Austin 
is a difficult thing to do, but also a big win for the market and for each of your buyers. Second, we prevented burdensome regulations and costs for rental housing providers in three very distinct and important ways. We stopped the implementation of a City of Austin voluntary landlord incentive program, which is city code for rental registration. Second, we prevented burdensome, oh, excuse me, then we negotiated a compromised agreement on the tenant's right to organize ordinance for the city of Austin that protects a tenant's existing right to organize while ensuring that rental housing providers maintain the right to manage their properties effectively. Then we made sure that small landlords are exempt from the city of Austin's seven day notice of proposed eviction regulations. All of the complexity of rental relationships between tenants and landlords has grown incredibly complex coming out of COVID. Our government affairs team, Taylor Smith as deputy director of government affairs especially, has worked very, very hard this year. And you should expect that he'll have to keep working hard. So please do support the work that we're doing in advocacy. The third big advocacy win that we had this year is our continued fight for an updated land development code. The last one we adopted was the actual year of my birth. And I would venture that things have changed a touch in the city of Austin since I was born. Um, so it's, you know, getting close to over 40 years old. Now you know how old I am. Over the last year, ABOR advocacy helped advance several code amendments that help prioritize housing supply and affordability across the city of Austin. These advocacy wins are literally made possible by the relationships that we hold with elected officials, which are built on the back of TREPAC dollars. Your contributions to TREPAC ensure that we have the relationships with elected officials that we need to ensure the wins that Taylor and his team go to secure. So please do continue your investments in TREPAC. And each of those relationships begins in an election year through the relationship that we build as part of the endorsement process. This year, ABOR members conducted hours of local candidate interviews to identify candidates whose views most aligned with ABOR's public policy priorities, those that represent the interests of you and your clients, and who would be advocates for realtors and home ownership by putting housing first. Six candidates running for local office were ultimately endorsed by our board of directors. You'll get to hear from one of them, Austin mayoral candidate, and someone that you probably recognize, Kirk Watson, a little later in today's program. In the meantime, I encourage everyone to get out and vote in the December 13th runoff elections, especially those of you in the city of Austin. Early voting actually starts tomorrow. Who knew that you could vote again? What an exciting thing. Our staff has put together a stellar election guide at abor.com vote to help you read up on all of the candidates that will represent your interests and the importance of supporting this housing market. So please check that out, abor.com vote. I really can't overstate how important realtor advocacy is to your careers and the communities. Um, your ability to directly engage in the future of this housing market, of our local economy, and choosing elected officials and leaders that will represent your interests and the interests of your clients is an incredibly important aspect of the work of the association and a very important aspect of your work as professionals in this industry. So we encourage you to continue to stay connected to that work, to consider volunteering with us, and please come along and learn more about the advocacy program. We're going to be talking more about it next year in all the different programming that we offer, and we hope that you'll recognize opportunities to plug into that good work, too. To close out today's State of the Association, I've got some big changes coming to the MLS next year that I want to talk with you about. In February, Actress is going to launch a new leasing management system called Rent Spree in our marketplace. Rent Spree is going to provide standardized leasing processes, including a tenant screening process to guide agents along a clear path during the transaction and improve organization and professionalism along the way of, the, of leasing transactions. I want to recognize and thank all of the members of our leasing management system task force. They spent many, many hours helping us ensure that we understand the unique needs of leasing and property management agents, that we understand the purpose and value of our LMS system. They looked at all types of vendors and ultimately recommended rent spree to our board of directors for approval. We're excited to launch this benefit next spring slash winter. If you work in leasing and property management, we think that you're going to love rent spree. If you don't work in leasing and property management, but you think you're going to, you should probably engage in it <laughs> because it is a tool that will help guide you through a transaction that you might not be as familiar with. We know that this will bring a level of professionalism to you that you will directly benefit from. 
One more thing that's been a long time coming that many of you might not be aware of is that we've identified and will launch a new brand identity for our MLS. So what that means is that when we say actress and you don't know what it means, we'll say now a new word and you'll actually know what it means. And then it correlates to the multiple listing service. Um, and more importantly, we think that this is, will be a brand that resonates with your clients, that they will understand what the purpose and value of the multiple listing service is, and that they will understand your value as a professional that has access to that tool by launching a brand that is unique and specific to the MLS system. We're excited to launch also with that a new consumer awareness campaign, an industry relations campaign that will allow us to promote your value as professionals in this marketplace and promote the value of the tools that you use to support clients through a shifting market. Finally, our vision of creating the MLS of the future continues to evolve with our investment in Remine. Over the next 18 months, you will directly experience the benefits of our ownership of Remine. You will be a part of an MLS that is literally invested in the technology that you will rely on each and every day. We're on track to expand your Remine benefits to include the ability to enter, add, edit your listings, and upload and manage documents directly with Remine, potentially as early next fall. But for now, we'd like you to listen up to one thing, <laughs> just one. I want you to take away from today's State of the Association that outside of the MLS, Remind Pro and RPR, another tool available at your disposal, are two of the most critical tools that you can have in your tool chest right now. One of the reasons we invested in Remind was its jaw-dropping ability to farm and analyze on and off market data. So in a shifting market where you're having to work differently and maybe a little harder at the front end of the business, you need a tool that helps you identify potential clients, helps you curate leads, helps you send mail to those clients, helps you farm in a way that you haven't had to do in a while, or maybe you've never done because you're an agent that joined in this awesome upswing that we've experienced over the last few years. There's literally not another tool that does what Remind does in terms of allowing you to cater to this shifting market. Meanwhile, RBR has, mass, has released a massive improvement to MLS mobile technology. They're allowing um, you to have access to full MLS data with incredible uptime and speed, accuracy. It's got a top-notch CMA tool and connects you with the data and tools and reports that you need in the field while you're sitting in front of the house doing the things. RPR is the tool that we think you should consider using so that you can get the speed and access to data that you need in the field. Together, these tools are lifelines as the market is shifting. If you're not already using both Remind and RPR in your day-to-day -day business, we strongly recommend that you do so. You can sign up for a free MLS training at abor.com slash take a class and access both Remind and RPR on your Clarity dashboard. Before we conclude our State of the Association, it's our last call to purchase raffle tickets for the Abor Foundation's Dream Vacation Raffle. Head to the table at the back of the room, purchase tickets before we draw the winner at 11.30. I know our foundation volunteers and Diana would love to see you back there. As realtors, the question you're getting um, the most now and always is, how's the market? What's happening? And for the love of God, please stop reading national headlines. Central Texas is going through its first significant housing shift, and you're having to navigate conversations with clients, level setting their understanding of what's happening in market, and helping them understand that how's the market is a loaded question, and that you need to answer that with nuance and detail that allows them a full understanding of their potential as a buyer or a seller. We're going through our first big market shift in over a decade, and it's imperative that each of you as agents has a clear understanding of where our market is going so that you can articulate that back to your clients and allow them to make the best business decisions they can make about their property. Dr. Jessica Louts is going to help you do that. She's the Deputy Chief Economist and VP of Research at the National Association of Realtors. The core of her research focuses on analyzing trends for both NAR members and housing consumers. She makes economics fun. Through the management of surveys, focus groups, and data analysis, she prevents new and innovative ways to showcase realtor, excuse me, showcase results. Please help me welcome Dr. Louts to the stage. Rock on. I am super excited to be here with you today. 
That title is uh, brand new to me. Um, I announced it uh, on LinkedIn and all the social media as I was flying here on my layover at DFW. And I was like, oh my God, this is real. I have to like actually put this out here. This is happening. And then I boarded the flight and I was like, oh, this is a big deal. And then I was like crying in the plane and people are like, what's wrong with her? So like, that's cool. Because originally I told my godmother who's turning 82 this year and I'll talk about her later, trust me. Um, and she, I called her and I was like, oh my God, Oh, this is huge, I got a title change. And she was like, well, do you get more money? And I was like, no. Is your boss still there? Yeah, well, what's a big deal? Like, this is nothing. And I was like, thanks, cool, love you, bye. Okay, so anyway, let's jump in. So I have a lot of data to share. I know it's early in the morning. I've had a lot of coffee though. I just ordered like a quad shot and I was like, I'm good to go, let's go. Okay, so let's jump in, let's talk about data. I'll make some jokes along the way. I'll definitely make fun of my godmother and other family members, okay. <laughs> So as was already stated, let's not trust the headlines right now because the sky is falling. Let's please, please, please not trust the TikTok videos and the Instagram reels that are just bogus when we talk about the housing market right now. I don't know what people are thinking, but when we talk about the housing market, we have to remember it's local. We have to remember that even this association is representing how many counties, and that's miles away, hours away from each other, and your zip code and your street is going to be different, and you're the local expert. All of that said, I'm gonna give you a bunch of national data. Aren't you excited? Okay, all right, so the big thing that we're hearing is that homes are staying on the market for a longer period of time. Oh my goodness, it's increased so much. Yeah, okay, so when we look at this chart, sure, it's increased from an all-time low of 14 days on market, but we're still looking at the vast majority of homes moving in under a month. And if we take this data and we look out a much longer period of time, the longest that we can bring this back is looking at 2011. And when we do that, we see that the typical days on market were nearly 100. That is a very, very different conversation with that seller. Just to get a read of this room, who entered real estate in the last two years? All right, okay, number of you. Who has been in real estate for like 20 years? And you're like, I have seen booms and busts. I have seen ups and downs. Okay, so it's a big mix. All right, so if you've been in the market for the last two years, this is a very different market. If you've been in the market for 20 years, this is not 2008. Okay, there, there we go. <laughs> Let's level set right now. And when we look at this, there's a bunch of data points that suggest this. One is days on market. The other one is the typical number of offers that each seller is receiving right now. So yes, in the spring of this year, it reached an all-time high of 5.5 offers because everyone knew that interest rates were gonna go up. And because interest rates were gonna go up, there was this frenzied activity in the marketplace. I remember having a phone conversation with my husband's cousin who called me frantically and said, there's never going to be any other homes available. Interest rates are gonna go up. So I'm bidding 100,000 more than asking price. And I was like, okay, are you sure? <laughs> like, how long do you plan on staying in that place? Because that's the big question. If you plan on staying there for a long period of time, okay you're locking in that lower interest rate. If you're not, and you're planning on making a lot of family members, babies, and moving quickly with your new wife, then that's gonna be a problem. So let's talk about the length of time you plan on living there, and also go ask your realtor, because I'm not a realtor. What's really important here is we saw that frenzied pace in the market where people were seeing homes for 15 minutes, where lines were around the block, especially here in Austin, where you had a massive, massive migration flow, and you still do. It's still trickling into your state. Everywhere in the South, we're seeing this migration flow here from other parts of the country. And it pushed up home prices to this outrageous amount in Austin itself, 45% year-over-year home price increases. Every presentation I give, I pick on Austin because your all's home prices were astronomical. Boise was hot, but Austin was real hot. And so when we talk about that, we have to put all of this in perspective. Home prices here, still increasing, more than 8% year over year. Unlike a, a good market, a solid market, a pre-pandemic market, three to 5% would be a good place to be for home price increases. So 8% is still really strong. So when we see this number of offers for every home that's listed, and you're setting those expectations with sellers, sure, it's not gonna be that insane market, but that wasn't a good market for anyone, really. Maybe a seller, but not necessarily, honestly. And when we look at this and we look at 2.4 offers, that's actually, when we look at the time span, that's the average, that's the median, that's everything, we're right in the middle there. So this is a more normalized marketplace. Not quite normal yet, but more normalized. 
The other one that really speaks to this too is contingencies. I don't have a long time span on this data set and we only started asking it because you all said, this is a problem. People are waiving contingencies. They're waiving that home inspection. They're doing everything frantically to get into this home and they're not really looking at the home before they move in. And so people did this and they did this confidently. We're still seeing this in the marketplace. What I have to say is even though we see about 20% of the marketplace is waiving the appraisal, about a quarter of the marketplace is still paying all cash. So if you're paying all cash, you don't need that home appraisal at all. And so that's, I think, what's taking up a large part. What perhaps is concerning is that we're still seeing a significant portion of the market waiving that home inspection, feeling confident. Now, it very well could be they plan on demolishing that house. They plan on completely remodeling and they don't really care. They're really buying it for the lot, but that's a lot of homes being purchased for the just the lot. The other one that's being talked a lot about too is non-primary residence buyers. So I know that you have them. Airbnb, yes. Hot topic, fun topic. We're seeing a lot of people purchase what is an investment property, a vacation home. There is no clear definition anymore. If you can rent out that property as a short-term rental, you absolutely may do it and put that on a piece of technology and you're gonna go and do that. What's really important is we're back down to about the midpoint here. And when we look at the market in January of this last year, so it's almost a year ago now. Do you all remember January? It's a dark time, I don't like it. January sucks. Okay, if we look at January, what we saw during that time period is every single headline when we talk about real estate is this is the lowest inventory we have ever recorded since 1999 when we first started recording inventory numbers on a national basis at NAR. If you have the lowest of anything out there, what's gonna happen? Investors are gonna say, that's an opportune time for me to purchase that product. That is a great time. And so they jumped into the market and they said, this is a short-term rental, this is a long-term rental, this is a property I'm gonna flip. Whatever it was, investors said, I'm coming in. The other thing that happened during that time period is a lot of people wanted to go on vacation, but they couldn't. Or they could, but they had to come back with a negative COVID test. And so we saw a lot of people buy the second home while interest rates were incredibly low before they knew they were going to go up and say, let me buy that domestic vacation property. And so a lot of people jumped into the market then too. This is where I think we really need to hit this home with consumers, is that when we talk about this changing marketplace, this is not the boom and the bust. We do not have loose money today. And when we look at this, I'm being asked a lot about, well, are prices gonna fall so much that maybe I can jump into the market as a consumer? Or are we gonna have this massive wave of distressed sales? Frankly, no. And there's a lot of reasons behind that, and I'll jump into some of them. But if we just look at the straight data right now, we ask realtors on a monthly basis, how many of you have worked with a distressed seller? And what we see is it's 1% of realtors in the last month. Now, I've heard the term <laughs> distressed but with equity. I don't know what that means. Maybe that was just a really, really distressing seller. Maybe that was, a, I, don't, I don't know what happened there, but it was, a, it was distressing, but they had equity. And that, that's the important thing to note, is that the vast majority of home buyers and homeowners, once they're into that home, they have housing equity because we're still seeing those home prices go up. Still seeing them go up in your area more than 8% year over year, which indicates that they're going to build equity in that home and they're gonna build it faster than they would have historically. What's also important here is if we look back at that time period, we're making these really bad comparisons to the boom and the bust. If we look back at 2009, in the spring of 2009, about half of realtors were working with a distressed seller at that time. So it is a very, very different marketplace and a different conversation. When we look at what's coming next and we look at the reasons why that's not going to happen, one, tight lending standards. If we look at lending standards right now, you have to have a high income. You have to have a high credit score. You have to have money in reserves to be able to secure that loan. I remember back in that boom period, I was working in DC, I was working in a nonprofit. I was making um, $18,000 a year, I'll admit that. Um, and I remember my coworker working at the same nonprofit and she was like, oh, I'm getting married. Everyone's buying homes, so I'm gonna buy a home. And I was like, cool, all right, how? Like, are your parents buying that? Like, oh, what's gonna happen here? She's like, no, 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 I'm getting married. So it's like dual income. We're like, we're gonna combine incomes, we're gonna buy this house. I was like, okay, so like $40,000 a year, cool. All right, so like he worked on the hill, like he ain't making anything. So I was like, all right, cool. So. 
I was like, okay, like, where are you buying a house? Like, here, right now, in this frenzied, crazy market. And, you know, I knew nothing about real estate, really, at that time period. And she was like, well, I got qualified for a mortgage at $850,000. So I can buy anywhere. $850,000 and you're making $40,000 a year? This is a very different marketplace than what we're seeing today. Like, that is scary. She didn't buy that house, I don't think. I don't know. But, you know, we hope that she didn't. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of shaking of heads. And, yeah, okay. So, anyway, when we look at this marketplace, we see that lending is tighter. You have to have that higher credit score. The other thing that makes it really important and what a very different marketplace it is today is I heard just how hard it is to build a home in Austin a couple times this morning already. If we look at this on a nationwide scale, we are short six and a half million homes in the US, at least. That is a really big problem when we talk about the housing shortage. We have been underbuilding for a solid 15 years. Last year, housing starts went up, so that was encouraging. We're thinking, oh, more inventory is going to come into the marketplace, but it didn't. Builders said that they had a lot of problems because of labor supply, because of actual supplies, and they couldn't actually be, make these homes be built. They canceled a lot of contracts for buyers, and then they're suddenly back in the marketplace. The other big factor here, which makes this market different, is demographics. And I'll talk a lot about that, because it's real important when we look at this. The one big thing that's happening is that millennials are aging in, so we can blame them, it's their fault, that they're really pushing up home prices. But the other big issue, we can blame them, are seniors. They're staying in place. Like my godmother, she's not leaving her single family three bedroom home. She's living there by herself with her Cadillac. That's where she wants to live. So when we see this and she's 82 years old and she has no intention of moving, in fact, she remodeled last year, we know that, the, truly, her kitchen and her bathroom, why not? So when we look at this, when we see this, what we see is that people are really facing this really short housing stock and it's becoming an increasing issue. All right, let's move on. Okay, so everyone wants to know what's gonna happen next for next year. The expectation, our chief economist, Dr. Lawrence Yu, and this is his current forecast. What I will say is we hold an NAR forecast summit. It's going to be December 13th, noon to 2 p.m. It is free, you can register, it's great. We're gonna have like 20 housing economists come in and talk about the overall market, but this is our current forecast right now. We expect in 2023 that home sales will continue declining, 7%. When we look at this chart, what we have to look at though is that we're going to go back to 2018 to 2017 in the housing market, 2019. It is not going to be the last two years that's in the green, that's the frenzied activity, that's outside the norm where we saw home prices go up by 45% here. So we're looking more at that time period. What's also important to note is that we expect on a national scale that home prices will continue increasing for 2023 at 1%. Now I will say that every estimate that Dr. Lawrence Yoon, he probably will hate me for saying this, every estimate that he puts out for home price increases, the economy seems to beat that. And the reason why I think is because of demographics, it's because people do have higher incomes and they can meet these higher home prices even with the rise in rates. So even though we are seeing that rates have risen to a 20 year high at 7% about, a little under in the last two weeks, that translates into $1,000 more for a mortgage payment in January versus today. There are still buyers in the marketplace. There's still a lot of people who can pay all cash and they're coming into the market. So that's gonna keep home prices from falling and that lack of inventory. All right, so a virtual world. I understand there's a lot of people in the Zoom right now, which is really cool. We are in this very different world right now where maybe the room would be double the size if everyone was here. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we were in Orlando, we were at the NAR Next conference, and a hurricane hit, and so a lot of people drove from crazy places, like from Atlanta to Orlando. I don't know how they did that, uh, to make it there on time to be at the conference. But a lot of people had to join via Zoom because four canceled flights in a row, you just can't make it there. At a certain point, you just have to call quits. We are in this virtual world, and I don't think it's going anywhere. We have to embrace it. And if we looked at home buyer activity, it's really being influenced by this world right now. One of the things that continues to happen, what I suspect is actually higher here than the single digit number, is that a lot of people are purchasing their home sight unseen. They are relying on you to tell them what that home smells like, what that home sounds like, what is behind those photos that they can't actually see. 
and they're putting that reliance on you as the agent. And the reason why I suspect it's higher here is because people are moving farther distances. Inventory is tighter here than other places in the country. So because of that, they may be on a work trip or they may be moving from New York City or from some other city in the country and they can't physically get here in time before that home is under contract. I've heard the stressful situations that this is putting agents in and these binds where really that home buyer is first seeing that home at the closing table. That is very interesting to me. Um, I don't think this is going away though. And the reason why is because even though there has been slightly more inventory coming in the market, that's contracting because people are saying I have separation anxiety from my low mortgage, we are seeing that this I think is here to stay. And unfortunately, we're gonna have to embrace it. The other reason why this is happening is because when we look at this long distance moved, a lot of people are moving farther out. We've collected this data for a pretty long period of time now, and it got a lot of headlines when we released this just a couple weeks ago. And we heard a lot about how home buyers are moving to small towns. Now, we'll, I will say, this is self-reported data. So if someone's moving from New York City and they're moving to Nashville, for instance, they may say they're moving to a small town. Nashville still has bad traffic, so no, I don't think that's a small town. We do not define this as the, the, the size of the population there. So that is important. But what is important when we look at this data as well is that they're moving 50 miles. Yeah, if I had showed you, I had no reason to put together that timeline before. Why would I ever show you this timeline? This is very boring. But this year, it jumped from 15 to 50. If we look at repeat buyers, it's actually 90 miles as a median distance. That is a very long distance away. So we asked them, what, what was the deciding factor for your neighborhood choice? So one is quality of the neighborhood, obviously top of the list. The second one that's up top, affordability. If you can't afford being in the city center, you are moving so far away. You are moving to the outer suburbs. You are moving to that small town. You're moving to that rural area. The other thing that's happening as well is that people are saying, I want to be close to my friends and family. And that's a big deciding factor. So maybe they're moving from this city center where they had been working as a young adult, or maybe they're chasing the grandbaby because uh, the grandbaby's not going to chase them. And so they're moving to this area as well. And we're seeing that that is a top priority. Also, remote work trends, that is absolutely a guiding factor. If you only have to be at work once a month, once a week, you can move farther out. You can suck up that longer commute, and people are absolutely willing to do that right now. All right, everyone's favorite hated hot topic. Okay, I know we hate them, right? I am one, but we hate me. Okay, so, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm a geriatric one, but I'm still gonna claim it. Okay, you've heard the term geriatric, elderly, millennial, okay, yeah. Um, so my little sister is a baby millennial. I mean, some, some groups would define her as Gen Z, but she, she's a baby millennial. Uh, she purchased her first house this year. I am so, so incredibly proud. Uh, not only because she's a single woman and she was purchasing a house by herself, but also she was living in my basement and now she's not, so it was really cool. Okay, so it's like her one year anniversary of owning her place at this point. She has earned so much equity and her friends are really jealous uh, because they weren't able to do that and move in with me. Um, and you know, I charged her rent. It did not cover her wine at all. Don't talk about her groceries or the fact that she adopted a 50 pound dog when I was on a work trip. Um, that was cool. I have four cats, so that worked out well. Um, but we talk about millennials and we give them a lot of grief. And I'm gonna, I will show you some data why it's important that we talk about them in the housing market today. One, they are more than 40% of home buyers today. So they are important. I know that we talk about they're gonna live in their family member's home forever, they're gonna eat the avocado toast, but she's eating the avocado toast in the kitchen. So she made that joke herself. When we look at this and we look at the US population overall, this is why it becomes so important, is because this is every, every person in the country today. You, me, everyone. Little pandemic babies born in the green in the last year, all the way to, you know, the bars get shorter as you get to my godmother's age. Okay, so if we look at this chart, smack dab in the middle of the chart is the millennial generation. It's the blue, it's the sea of blue. What becomes really important in this chart is the median age of a first time home buyer is 36 years old. That is represented in the red bar in the middle of the blue there. It used to be 33. It's now been pushed up so that the first time homebuyer is closer to the age of 40 than they are to 30. 
That's pretty depressing in itself, but becomes really important when we talk about the lack of housing inventory is that there is the biggest population in the US right now that is between the ages of about 26 to 32 years old. And they are pushing in and trying to have household formation, but they are really struggling to be able to afford that. When we look at the share of first time home buyers, I'm gonna take it real dark for a while, okay? It's just gonna get real depressing, okay? The share of first time home buyers, it is dropped to an all time low. This is the smallest share that we have recorded in our 41 year history. Yeah, so they have hurdles inside the housing market. We've talked about them, affordability, the rising rates, lack of inventory, and then of course the hurdles outside of the buying market as well, the rise in rents going up 30, 40, 50% year over year, student loan debt, car payments, childcare costs, all of that, that's holding back first time home buyers. And we know that because we've asked them a lot of questions on what is holding you back from buying. It's their American dream to buy a house, but they can't enter home ownership because of that. And it's push up the age. Okay, so 36 years old for a typical first time home buyer today. When we look at this for repeat buyers though, this is also pretty important. The typical repeat buyer is close to retirement age. That is fascinating. We used to see the typical repeat buyer was 36 years old. That was a very quick trade. They were able to make that early in life. Now we see that a very different time period in life. People are living longer outside of COVID. They're working longer. They're feeling confident making this very large purchase at a very different time span, and they're purchasing a primary residence home. That could be their retirement property, but they are actually making this purchase later in life. If we think back to our grandparents' generations or our great-grandparents' generation, were they making that purchase? No, they were just kind of staying there, or they were thinking about moving into a nursing home or a family member's home. But we know now that it's really no one's American dream to move into a nursing home. That has absolutely changed in the last couple of years, right? Like, no one wants to, but that has absolutely been really marked off the list. And so as we see this transition, we really have to think about that lack of inventory. So my little sister, you know, I make fun of her a lot, but I also present on this data. And sometimes I practice at home and show her charts. And so she gets me and she absolutely manipulates me by saying, can I move into your house? Because I wanna be a first time home buyer. When we look at this data, I am one of the gullible people. Is there anyone else gullible in this room? Anyone? Like, I cannot be the, thank you, thank you, thank you, okay. They may leave one day, I, maybe, I hope for you. Okay, there's two of us who are gullible. Um, but when we look at this, the highest share of young adults moved home in the last two years. They said, yes, absolutely, I can skip rent, but I also have the ability to pay down these debts and be able to enter into home ownership. And when we look at first time home buyers, this is the biggest share of first time home buyers at 27% who moved from their family members home into home ownership. The way that the first time home buyers got there this year is because they moved home. I think that is fascinating. That does not make your job easier. That makes it significantly harder because when they go on that home tour, they are coming with mom and dad or stepmom and dad and so on and so on. And all of them are contributing to that decision. They also probably have very high expectations that their home should look like mom and dad's home and be in mom and dad's neighborhood. And that's not something they can afford. Though 22% of them also have down payment assistance from mom and dad. That is a significant generational transfer of wealth. And so when we think about home buyers today and the haves and the have nots, those who have that opportunity are taking advantage of it. All right, so that's a myth that I basically confirmed. Okay, so not busted. One of the other things that we talk about right now when we talk about young adults is not having kids, and that's absolutely true. So when we look at home buyers today and we look at this data, what we see is that the typical home buyer, when we look back at 1985, had a kid in their home. Today, it is less common. When we think about this though, it does open up some buying power because if you're not paying $2,000 a month for a child in daycare, you suddenly have a lot more buying power for that house. What it does say too though, is it's going to change the location of where that buyer is looking. Suddenly the dog park has moved to really high and I know that's really fluffy as like a data point, pun intended y'all. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. It's bad when you have to explain it. Okay. Um, <laughs> We are absolutely seeing that rise as an importance. Schools though, we're seeing them drop in importance, especially for young millennials, for single women who don't necessarily have those kids in tow like they did once before. 
The other thing that it could change here is the number of moves. Because if you have a growing family, you suddenly need that extra bedroom. Or if you're downsizing, you don't, though my godmother won't leave, so she does. So we can see this as well. The other big trend when we talk about demographics and we talk about young adults is marriage. And when we talk about that, what we do see is for first time home buyers, only half of them are married today. And this absolutely mirrors marriage rates in this country. So if we look back at the 1960s, 70% of American adults were married. Today, just half. Now, here was like the year of the wedding. And there was lots of weddings. It was also the year of the divorce. And there was lots of divorces. Pandemic was hard. So this kind of evened out. And when we look at first-time homebuyers, why this matters is, of course, affordability. So we see a lot of single women in the marketplace, but they've kind of waned this year because of housing affordability. The other thing that we have seen that I think is really fascinating, unmarried couples, really high. It's an all-time high. Roommates, 5% of all first-time homebuyers purchasing as a roommate. Are you all working with any roommates who are purchasing homes? Or a roommate who's going to rent out a bedroom once that buyer purchases with mom and dad's money? That's also happening, <laughs> right? I mean, it is. We're seeing that. So not necessarily if they're both on the mortgage, but we are seeing that as well. I think these are interesting trends. I think they're trends to watch, and I think they're trends to pay attention to because they don't seem to be going away. All right, so I gave you a lot of negative data. Are you guys, you guys do not look psyched at all. Okay, all right. I'll tell some more stories here soon about family members. When we, when we talk about money, though, I do think it's interesting. We are seeing a lot of repeat buyers paying all cash, the highest share we have ever recorded in the marketplace today. This is a big shift from what we have seen. And I think people are saying, I don't want to pay that higher mortgage rate, but also I have a lot of equity. For the typical homeowner who purchased a home 10 years ago, that's a typical tenure in their home, they have $210,000 in housing equity. That's a lot. So if you are moving to that farther suburb, if you are moving to that small town in a different area 90 miles away, you suddenly may be able to finance a very small portion of that home and put down this an enormous down payment, if not pay all cash. And something that I think is interesting here is that for all home buyers, they're diversifying where they're finding that down payment. They're no longer only relying on that equity in that home, they're also pulling from savings. They're pulling from their 401k, they're pulling from crypto, they're pulling from all these different sources. If we look at first time home buyers, even more so, pulling from mom and dad, but also savings, 401k being tapped more now than it has been in the past. And maybe it's because they have to because home prices have gone up. Maybe it's because they feel comfortable doing so because home prices are going up, so they're gonna earn equity, and maybe those returns will be better than the stock market, so they're feeling comfortable there as well. There's a huge misconception out there about what the down payment is. So when I threw my sister a housewarming party and cooked all her food and sent a house cleaner there, because um, she now has two cats so along with her dog, and we weren't going to have people there with that much cat hair, um, it, you know, it was really interesting because her friends were saying, you know, you need like 20% down for a down payment. How'd you get that together, Shannon? And it, this is not true. People do not know about low down payment programs at all. In Virginia, where I live, there's a program where you can just put 1% down if you qualify with that income. Every local area and state has these programs. But also, if we look at this, there's FHA loans, there's USDA loans, there's VA loans that people don't know about. In the last year, half of realtors have worked with a client who had all those loans rejected though, right? Because if you had that multiple bid situation where there are 5.5 offers and one of those was all cash, one of those was conventional financing where they were financing 50% of that loan, they were not going to win in that bidding process. I think now could be this opportune market because we see less offers to revisit those clients. If they have lost out repeatedly, they're probably feeling really discouraged. But if they have a higher income, this could be the market for them to be able to enter. It's hard to scrape together that down payment unless you are able to tap mom and dad and that 401k loan, but some people aren't. But they may have that higher income then they can qualify for that mortgage. They just have lost out on so many offers. So this could be the chance. When we look at this and we ask consumers what they think they need for that typical down payment, huge misconceptions there. Some people actually think you need more than 20% down. When we actually look at the data, the typical down payment for first time home buyers is just six to 7% in the last several years. It never really tops that at all. So this becomes really important to convey that message and put the facts out there, put that information out there to consumers. All right. So senior buyers. So I recently had the opportunity um, 
to amazing, this was amazing to me. Uh, the Hawaii realtors invited me out to go and talk to them. And I speak a lot and I go to amazing places like here in Austin, uh, Knoxville, Nashville, all these cool places, but like Hawaii, like, come on now, like it's Hawaii. So I asked my husband, I was like, oh my God, I just got invited to go to Hawaii and this was approved and I get to go to Hawaii, like they're realtors, this is really cool. Um, and so my husband, I was like, yo, can, do you wanna come with me? And he got really stressed out and he was like, absolutely not. Like I have to, I have a job and like, I can't do that. And that's a lot of time off of work and the time change and blah, blah, blah. So then I turned to my sister who's really spoiled and I was like, okay, I already have a hotel room, it's free, do you wanna come? And you work from home a lot anyway. And she's like, I just bought a house and I have a menagerie of pets. Like I have a family to take care of. And I was like, right, okay, sorry, okay. And so she said no, obviously. So then I called my godmother, cause she, she lives in Seattle and she's retired. And so I was like, okay, well it's halfway home for the flight. I live in DC, so it's perfect, right? It's only five hours. So I was like, okay, no pressure. I've already been turned down a lot. Like, do you wanna come? And immediately she's like, yes, no, I'm coming. And I was like, oh, oh, okay, cool. And then she was like, can I bring my little sister? And I was like, Aunt Carol? Yeah, like you can bring Aunt Carol. And or, like, she's 76, so like, cool, like your little sister, that's cool. So I'm like, oh, this is gonna be amazing, right? Like, I'm so, so excited to go on this trip, speaking, obviously, but like, we're gonna stay for a few extra days and I'm gonna be so relaxed. I'm gonna lay by the pool, I'm gonna go to the beach every day, it's gonna be great, like the most relaxing vacation ever, um, work trip. And so I, I packed one book and then I packed two books and I was like really excited for this, right? So we get there, um, no, 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 no. I was so tired, y'all. <laughs> like, they were like, can we go zip lining? And I was like, no. <laughs> can, we, um, can we wake up at five in the morning and then go dive with sharks? I was like, no, like, no, we're not doing that. Like, absolutely not. You're not stable on your feet, let alone sharks. I, like, no. And this was really, really um, a wake-up call to me that uh, seniors today are different than uh, maybe in the past. Like, I knew that my godmother had been remodeling her house and was spending all this money, but uh, yeah, no, uh, like, I had no idea that they don't sleep and they just want to do fun things, more so than, like, my little sister who's 29 years old. So I, I think this is really, really a fascinating generation to watch, and they have a lot of money, and they're in the housing market, so let's talk about them too, okay? All right, so... <laughs> one of the things that's really interesting here is that all of the myths that we have about them are wrong. Or maybe you all don't have these myths. I don't know, I, I had them, I had misconceptions. I thought, you know, you hit 80, maybe you think about moving in with family or a nursing home, but you don't apparently anymore because you're aging gracefully and you're not aging. Um, in fact, when I called her the other day to tell her my exciting news, she watched her friend get out of the car and she's like, man, old people. I was like, what? Like, what are you talking, like, do you need to walk your friend? She's like, no, like, some people just can't age well. And I was like, damn, okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay, that's an okay word to say, right? Um, so. When we look at this data, it's fascinating to me. One, they're purchasing in different ways. They're purchasing with roommates in the way that young adults are too. So Grace and Frankie, do you all watch that? Yeah, okay, so like they're all over this trend. Like Grace and Frankie copied what's happening right now in the actual real estate market. The other thing that we know is they are purchasing what they want. They are purchasing all the green features. They are purchasing a large home. It has all the bells and whistles. It is newer and it is more expensive in a lot of cases than where they're moving from. So they may be downsizing in price if they can find it, but they're certainly not downsizing in quality or space at all. And so we really see that they are embracing a different way of life than we have seen for seniors in the past. They absolutely feel comfortable chasing the grandbaby. So they are moving these longer distances and they're saying, oh, well, my family member lives there and I'm willing to actually move there. And I think this is really interesting and something to embrace. When we look at millennials, even when we look at Gen Xers, I know I've largely ignored you, you're fine with that, you're used to it. When, when we look at Gen Xers, they're making financial compromises on their home. They, they're making compromises on what that home looks like. They're willing to DIY. Millennials especially willing to put in that elbow grease. When we look at seniors, they're saying absolutely not. I want the tech features. I want the smart home features. So when we talk about them as home buyers, let's not count them out. 
let's understand that they are going to want these features and that might be your targeted audience for some of these really cool things. All right. The other thing that we are seeing, and this has happened at the beginning of the pandemic and people have just embraced it even more, and I don't think it's going away anytime soon, is multi-generational living. Whether it's multi-generational living in an ADU, whether that's in the property itself, people are embracing this. And this is a trend that obviously is very, very old, but it has come back into the forefront. And the number one reason is really for an elderly parent, for caregiving, for spending time with them to move into this home. But the second reason is also for cost savings. So it could actually be people of the same generation, but they're actually pulling incomes to nuclear families to do this as well. They can live in a nicer home in a bigger area, childcare is suddenly taken care of, and that helps as well. And I think this is an interesting trend as we see this transpire. The other thing that's happening here too is about a quarter, give or take, of minority families are purchasing multi-generational homes. So this is really important. If you're working with a lot of minority clients, this may be much more common for them. All right, how long exactly? So this, I think, is a really, really fascinating trend that we saw this year in the data. In fact, it made me take pause and be like, did we do math right? Um, but we did. So the first one is that people are staying in their homes for a long period of time. It's back up to an all-time high of 10 years. Not super surprising when we look at this. People have earned that equity. They have low interest rates. They bought a bigger home and they're saying, let me stay put, right? So COVID made a lot of people move and say, oh my gosh, suddenly I have to make that change. This is a longer time to keep in contact with those past clients, a much longer period of time than you would have in the past when people moved every six to seven years. What floored me this year though in the data is looking at first time home buyers and how long they plan to stay put. When we asked them that question for first time home buyers, they just purchased their first home at 36 years old. They plan on staying there for 18 years. So I will say expected tenure is always longer than actual tenure because something in your life happens that makes you move. And whether that's a new job or a new baby, a marriage, a divorce, all of these things cause a person to move. But 18 years is a very long period of time. So when we think about that, we have to keep that in mind is that these are different expectations for these young adults today. There absolutely is a hangover effect from the Great Recession. So if these young adults watch their parent go through a crisis in 2008 and 2009, they may be saying, no, 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 I have a low interest rate, I purchase now in an outer suburb in a small town, this is where I'm staying put. But it's something to keep in mind as you work with those clients is these expectations have changed. And we also have to remember that millennials are kind of like their grandparents. They're not necessarily like their parents when we think about that generation. So they may plan on stay put. They may actually have that intention. I did ask my sister this question because when we were playing with data, I always like, so how long are you staying put? And she was like, well, you told me I could never move because I financed at a really low rate. And I was like, yeah, but like, how long are you really staying put? And she's like, I'm never moving. And I was like, okay, but like you could partner up eventually. Well, they'll just move in here. And I was like, okay, whatever. So, you know, we have to think of these unrealistic expectations too. Her dog is large and needs a yard and she's in a condo that's three blocks away from me. She texted me this morning and she's like, yo, do you have any eggs? So like, I know when I go home, I will have no eggs because <laughs> That's where my groceries go. Um, it's fun though. She works at a bank. She could buy her own eggs. So when we look at this, what's also important to keep in mind here too is that for repeat buyers, they plan on living there for 15 years. So also a very long period of time. Again, that could be aging in place, especially when you're thinking about a 60-year-old buyer, never aging, but we're really talking about a very long period of time. All right, the agent. How in the world do you all fit in? So I have spanned a lot here, talking about market conditions, talking about demographics, making fun of family members. It's always fun for me. Um, not for them, but that's okay. Uh, when we look at this, what I think is really important to note is that you're integral. This is a very changing marketplace, but you're keeping pulse, you're keeping on top of it. And when we look at this data, what we see is that buyers get it. I talked about a couple rising generations here. So the rising millennial generation of buyers, single women as buyers. When we look at those populations, they're using agents at higher rates than anyone else. So everyone knows that technology is a tool that you can use, but everyone understands the value of the agent. You're able to help them navigate this marketplace 
Understand the local market, how your local market is different than everyone else's in this room, how you found your niche, and that's different as well. What becomes more important too is in this very stressful buying environment, you're going to guide them through that process. Even if it's a first time buyer, sure, this is their first time doing this, but if it's a repeat buyer, they haven't done this in a decade. So if we think back to 2012, this is a very different buying environment than it was at that time period. So you're guiding them through a process that's brand new to them. So setting those expectations is incredibly helpful. Negotiating, being there by their side, incredibly helpful. And explaining all of those terms in depth, like appraisal gap and so on, which they may not know. For sellers, we absolutely see the seller's agent is embraced. 87% of people using an agent in their selling process. And I have to say what I think is interesting here is that there's tons of business models. Everyone has a different business model in this room. But when we look at this and we ask, what type of agent do you want? Someone who lists on the MLS, ad hoc services, broad range. People are stressed and they have anxiety and they want your help to set those expectations, but tell them, okay, I've been binge watching a lot of HGTV. How do I fix up my home for sale? Tell me, how do I price this home? How do I market it? They want you to do everything, past that closing table to who do I contact for services? Because you're that guidepost. We do have reports on this. I know that home staging, remodeling, or at least, small remodeling things like painting or hardwood flooring refinishes, that curb appeal, all of that is becoming more important now as the market is changing. We have reports on that. So if you're working with a seller who's sticky on those things and saying, I don't know, does it make some sense to invest? My neighbor didn't have to last year. Well, yeah, it probably does. If you need to have the data to back up those conversations, they're free, they're on our website, as is all of this research. I wanna give you one final note here. I have done a long presentation now of data and no one wants to hear that first thing in the morning, but I'm gonna end it on this note. I have not touched on race at all. NAR has done a lot of reports on race in the last year and we are seeing it is increasingly difficult for black home buyers to enter into today's buying market. And when we look at this and we look at the homeownership rate, for black individuals versus white individuals. Oop. What we see is that it's as wide as when the Fair Housing Act started back in 1968. And we've done a lot of work at NAR. It was a big mid-year push at our mid-year conference in DC to really talk to the Hill, to talk to people about bridging this gap, about narrowing this gap. And they used our research, in fact, they put out statements saying NAR has done this research in the last year and we should look at this for policy changes. And that's like a career highlight to me to see that our research is being used in that way. But unfortunately, when we look at the last year, affordability has absolutely hit black individuals and Asian individuals who are trying to purchase homes. So we see a growing share of white home buyers and a shrinking share of black and Asian home buyers in the last year. And when we look at this, we know that there's higher denial rates for black individuals who are trying to purchase a home even successfully. We also know that black individuals are paying a disproportionate amount of rent. And so that's going to have a harder time just saving for that down payment. So I know that's a depressing note to end on, but I just wanna give food for thought there as well. All right, thank you. How great was that? Let's do another round. Thank you, Dr. Louts, for coming. Uh, uh, staff here gives us scripts. I don't like scripts. Emily's now wiping her brow. She's starting to sweat. I really want to tell you guys how proud I am of how far we've come. And to be able to get someone like Dr. Louts to come here and do this, she is so wanted in every association across the country to go and give these speeches. And it is just a huge honor for us to have her here. I loved hearing that. I usually can't stand going to these things. And I'm like, this is actually interesting stuff I can take back. So I hope you all got some good notes that you can take and some good talking points you'll share with your offices. And I hope you appreciate the value that we are trying to bring you. Uh, more than just paying your dues to get access to MLS. So I really want to send a special thank you to our staff, to uh, especially Danielle, Kalea, uh, Emily, putting together all this content, Lauren. There's a whole host of them. Christine, thank you guys. 
I, I, I tell you guys, the, 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 the staff changer that we've had over the last 10 years and where we are now, we have got such wonderful people doing such wonderful work for us. So thank you for your dues to help pay these wonderful people to do such a wonderful job. Y'all are great. Without further ado, uh, the Austin Board of Realtors advocacy, that is at the core of absolutely everything we try and do. At all levels of government, we tirelessly support policies that protect both our livelihoods and make housing affordable and accessible to everyone. Such a hot topic uh, in our country and in our city today. So as you've just heard from Dr. Louts, our housing market is normalizing, but we've still got a long way to go to that. Austin needs a mayor who will take bold action and put housing first. After an extensive candidate interview process led by our legislative management team, I can never say that word right, um, Abor believes that Kirk Watson is just the man for the job. Both as a Texas senator and former mayor of Austin, former mayor of Austin did a hell of a good job back in the late 90s early 2000s, I don't remember when you were out of there, but um, Kirk has, has a proven track record of bringing people together and making meaningful change happen. We've invited Kirk here today to talk about his housing policies and what realtors could expect from him as mayor. Um, again, off script, I'm wearing red. Uh, Kirk usually wears blue. I adore this man. We've been friends for a very long time. He did such an amazing job of carrying Austin through such a transition in the, in the late 90s. Um, I, I think he's so great for Austin, so great for us as realtors. He's great at bringing people together. As you all know, our city has been divided for many years over many hot topics, and that's one of my favorite things about Kirk, is he can really work both sides of the aisle, kind of put politics aside and make things happen, and I really think that that's what we need. So please remember, early voting starts tomorrow. Whoever you're voting for, for, get out and vote. That's what makes the difference. But I sure hope you'll look closely at one specific box and welcome our man, Austin's next mayor, Mr. Kirk Watson. Well, that was very nice. Um, I really I appreciate that. And I appreciate the chance to get to be with you all. And I want to start off by saying thank you. Because when Cord tells you that we went through a process and uh, you, the realtors uh, endorsed me in this race. I want to say thank you for that. Uh, it makes a difference, and it made a difference to me that you were with me in this race. We are in a runoff, as he pointed out. Uh, we always expected a runoff when you have that many people running and that many people that have basic constituencies, you expect to be in a runoff. So we were prepared, had a plan in place, we're executing that plan, started it the next morning, on Wednesday morning after the election. Along those lines, I'm going to talk a little substance here in a second, but along those lines, I would love to have any group of you, any one of you, all of you, come down to the headquarters and participate in phone calling or on the weekends knocking on doors. We, we are identifying our voters. We are encouraging our voters to get out. It's going very well, but we can always use more people to be part of that. And we need that. He's right, Cord's right. Tomorrow early vote starts and it runs through the 9th and then uh, the election day is the 13th. In my view, this is a very important race. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in this, right? Um, the, the truth of the matter is that, that City Hall, and you all know this, and I'm just going to be candid, City Hall has not done a good job, in my mind, of taking care of the basics of city government. And that includes everything from crime to housing to affordability to homeless to traffic. I mean, pretty much you name it. I don't believe, that's, and that's why I'm running, is I'm frustrated with that, and I know you are. The truth of the matter is, there's not a sense of immediacy. There's not a sense of urgency in taking care of those things, and that puts our great city, which has so much going for it, that puts our great city at risk of losing many of the things that we love about Austin, Texas. Liz and I moved to Austin in 1981. I was a baby. Um, but in 1981, when we got here, we thought we were only going to be here for one year. I had a job that was going to last one year, and we thought we'd go back up to North Texas where we, we, we grew up. 
And everybody kept coming up to us and saying, you'll never want to leave. Oh, you're going to love this place. You'll never want to leave. You'll never. And I, I remember us looking at each other and saying, man, we've never been in a place that acted like that. But sure enough, in about three months, we were saying, I wonder if we can make a living here. I wonder if we can stay here. Um, we love this place. I love the people. I've served as both mayor and in the state senate because I love serving the people. But here's the thing. We have to have a mayor that is going to be able to take on the big issues, build the kinds of consensus, build the coalitions that Cord talked about, and then get things done. I remember when I was mayor, they told me, you know, by the way, when I got elected mayor, there were three, maybe four places you could live in downtown Austin. And I said, we need to have more people living in downtown Austin. And I remember being told, you can't get that done. It's a zero-sum game. You've got, you got to have more retail or you've got to have more people. You never could make it work. Well, look what happened. We were able to vitalize downtown. I remember being told, we can't, we're, we're always going to have to use Bass Concert Hall. We're not going to be able to have our own performing arts center. We can't afford it. We can't get it done. And I remember putting together the deal that now we have the Long Center for the Performing Arts. You can't, we need to double the size of the convention center. Oh, you can't do that. You can't double the size because we don't have a convention center hotel. Well, let's do two things at once. Let's get a convention center hotel. In fact, that's how they said it. They said, Watson, we need to double the size of the convention center. And I said, okay, well, let's do it. And they said, well, you can't do it because you need to have a convention center hotel. I said, well, let's build a convention center hotel. They said, well, you can't do that because you need to double the size of the convention center. <laughs> yeah, okay. My point being, we were able to do all of those things. We were able to secure our water future for decades during that period of time. The war that was going on between the environmentalists and the developers was a de facto two-party system. You'll never be able to fix it. Not only were we able to stop it, we were able to set aside more preserve land than at any time in the history of Austin. And then we get to the Senate. And while I was in the Senate, we were able to do things like update and modernize the Public Information Act and the Open Meetings Act. We were able to um, uh, really address issues of sexual assault on college campuses. And of course, Austin had been told for decades, you don't get a medical school. You can't get a medical school in Austin, Texas. And I was proud to lay out 10 goals in 10 years that I wanted our community to achieve. And what it resulted in was a Dell Medical School at the University of Texas, a modern 21st century teaching and safety net hospital, Dell Seton Medical Center. And I was able to secure the money in the legislature to get the Austin State Hospital rebuilt as all part of that. Thank you. The reason I put all that out there is because the next mayor needs to be someone that has a proven track record of getting those kinds of things done. We cannot continue to screw around. We need to act. Think about this too. The ne this mayor's term is only two years because we've, the citizens have voted to move the mayor's election to presidential year, so it's only two years. There's no time to waste here, folks. We need to hit the ground running, and we need to do it with a sense of urgency and immediacy. Now I'm gonna share something personal with you. When I was a young man, uh, in my early 30s, I was diagnosed with cancer. And I thought I had the world by the tail at that point in time. If you had asked me, Watson, what are you going to be doing 20 years from now? If I was honest, I could have told you what I thought I was going to be doing within about a week. I mean, I had it all mapped out. And all of a sudden, I may not even survive. Survived the first round of it with multiple surgeries and chemo. And then a couple of years later, they found another tumor in my abdomen that was related to the original cancer. So they went in and field dressed me, uh, took all the lymph nodes. Um, and that was 95. That was the last treatment of any kind was in 95. The reason I even bring that very personal thing up is because there were a number of gifts of cancer, a number of gifts of cancer. But one of them, one of them was a sense of urgency. 
a sense of urgency that we need to be moving with dispatch on things that are important to us. Liz and I now have two um, well, perfect granddaughters. Um, I, I couldn't think of another word. I was trying very hard. Um, I mean, they're ideal. Um, one's named Effie and one's named Birdie. And my sense of urgency is not the same as when I was diagnosed with cancer, although that was the gift, one of the gifts that I, I learned. But it's for those girls. Because if you stop and think about it, 20 years from now, they're going to be roughly the age I was when I hit Austin, Texas. And I want them to love this place as much as I did and do and you do. I call it, frankly, the Effie effect. <laughs> the Effie effect, and we all, every one of us, has an Effie and a birdie in our life in one way or another. This is for them. This is for our city. This is why we must be urgent and why we cannot screw around. We need to elect a mayor that has proven they can get things done. And I'm going to do that for you. Help me get elected. Everybody in this room vote. Everybody in this room make a list of 5, 10, 15 people that you're going to make sure they vote because you know, this, this election of a million, in a town of a million people, the 11th largest city in America, could be determined by just over 100,000 votes. And I look at a good number here. Please, I thank you for your endorsement. I thank you for your interest in this. Let's keep Austin, Austin, and elect a mayor that will get it done. God bless you all. Thank you. Time for Kirk. Thank you, buddy. Hey, hello, friends. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Kent Redding. Uh, it's been an honor to serve on the board of directors for the past four years, and I'm thrilled to be the 2023 president-elect. And together, we're going to continue to foster the most engaged and professional realtors in the nation right here in Austin, Texas. I do want to warn you a little bit, though. Up here on stage, the light is extremely bright. And this dome right here, this, <laughs> this is particularly for you guys right in here. If it catches just right, I can put an eye out. So you guys be super careful over there. Uh, before we wrap up today, we got one big major announcement. And uh, this is something that Kurt could not deliver today. We, he did not have this. We have a dream vacation, the Abor Foundation. <laughs> Dream Vacation Raffle, and we're going to announce the winner. Uh, you heard earlier about the incredible work uh, that the ABAR Foundation does for our community each year in housing, education, and disaster relief. The proceeds from this raffle directly support these efforts throughout the year. To help me pick the winning ticket, I've asked the lovely and talented Mindy Clark, our 2023 Avor Foundation Chair to help me out. Mindy, would you mind doing the honors? And the winner is Mark Minju. Woo! Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mindy. thanks, Mindy. Congratulations, Mark. We'll be reaching out to you to share the details on claiming your dream come true vacation. Uh, hey, a big thank you to everyone who supported the ABOR Foundation uh, throughout the, for this year's raffle. Um, this concludes today's annual meeting. Thank you to the staff for an amazing morning putting this together. It's a ton of work behind the scenes to pull this off, and we are eternally grateful for the ABOR staff. Um, we're grateful for you guys to be here today. We love hanging out with our realtor friends, and that's a wrap. We'll see you next year.